thank you so much for being uh, with us today. No problem. Uh, so whenever you're ready, we could just kick it off and then we save some time at the end. And yeah, sure. Station have questions and so on. So right, let me just get my presentation full screen and then I will share my screen. Uh, okay, so let me do, 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 I'll see you later. Then. <laughs> yeah. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Do you want me to get going? Yes, please. Okay, awesome. So, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie Coleman. I wish I was there in person. Um, unfortunately, because of circumstances, I can't be. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for having me to start off with. Romania was the first uh, place I actually did a talk on my own. And because I got such good feedback and the audience were awesome, um, I decided to do this full time. So, here I am. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let me just get started. I'll introduce myself. Um, so, I'm a software engineer, but also I'm a developer advocate. Um, so I've worked on um, some really random stuff, to be honest. So when I first started my career, um, I worked on mainframes. So I was kind of um, trying to modernize their infrastructure. So turning some really old languages like Mate and PLX into Java. Um, and then I basically worked for WebSphere. So on the container team, so Docker containers had just become a thing. And we were the first product with Open Liberty to actually uh, containerize our product and get it onto Docker Hub. Um, and then I worked on a DevOps pipeline offering and then decided uh, then I basically got the offer to become a developer advocate. So since then, I've basically worked mostly with microservices, Kubernetes, Maven, Gradle, all, all the good stuff. Um, so, yeah. So here I am today. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about seriously open cloud native Java. And that basically is my favorite um, open source stack for creating microservices. So that includes OpenJ9, MicroProfile and OpenLiberty. And I'll go into a bit more detail about those in the presentation. Right, so a bit of an overview. Now, at the start, I'm going to give you some random facts about cloud, um, and I'll try and tie this in later on um, to the technologies I'm talking about and why what I'm saying matters. Then I'm going to quickly give you a brief history of open source and why I think open source is important. I'll talk a bit about Eclipse Micro Profile and the different specs. Then I'm going to give you a demo, and this demo is going to be on an online environment that you can all follow along and do it with me if you want. And there's also some other modules on there as well to do with cloud native Java. So feel free to do those as well. Um, so yeah, the demo I'm going to give you is about testing in containers and um, microshed testing, which is based on test containers and show you how easy it is to get up and running with that. Um, a little bit about Open Liberty and how it compares to some of the other Java application servers and where it kind of fits in this new world. And then I'm going to talk a bit about OpenJ9 some of the benefits that that can bring you. And then I'm going to demo um, one of the tweaks on the JVM um, just to kind of prove to you and show you um, what OpenJ9 can do. Okay, so like I said, um, it might seem a bit random at the beginning, but I'm going to give you some random facts about clouds and data centers. So to start with, um, there's a lot of data centers. So there's seven and a half thousand major data centers. These are the big ones, not the smaller ones we have for development in our, in our offices and stuff like that. Um, and the Natural Resource Defense Council estimates that about 3% of all electricity consumption is consumed by data centers. And that thing, we, we can't see these data centers. This is what's churning out, uh, churning through our data and powering our apps and powering the online world. So to put some things into perspective, um, every hour, we, the, the internet traffic, the, in, the information consumed by the internet traffic is enough to fill 7 million DVDs. I should probably update this to Blu-ray discs now, um, but that's enough to scale Mount Everest 95 times. And if I updated this to be Blu-rays, it wouldn't scale Mount Everest as much, so yeah. Um, so there's 500,000 major data centers, and these are in the ones that we include for development. Um, and the reason I got interested about energy and data centers was because there is one right next to my office. Um, and I used to love going in there and I love the sound, the noise, the, diff the heat when you go and then it's all of a sudden it's freezing cold. I mean, we've even got these really cool uh, machines that will grab tapes and then put them into a uh, tape drive for you, mainly used for mainframes and stuff like that. But in tw by 2021, so by next year, um, experts, rec uh, they, they think that one third of all data is going to start passing through the cloud. Now that's a lot of data. And Experts have also predicted that we could, in the next few years, data centers could be consuming one fifth of the global energy supply. So think, you've got cities like New York, Beijing, Vegas, Hong Kong, they're lit up like Christmas trees. Um, air conditioning going everywhere, lights everywhere. But data centers, these things we cannot see, 
are predicted to eventually start consuming one fifth of the global energy supply. I mean, that's a humongous amount of energy. Why am I talking about with that, about cloud native Java? Well, everyone talks about um, saving money on the cloud. That is what everyone keeps focusing on. And as a normal developer, yes, you may get a bit of kudos for saving a bit of money with your application on the cloud. But most people do care about energy and people do care about trying to save the planet and, you know, just trying to slow global warming. And at the end of the day, once the data center is set up, um, once they've built the building and they've got all the hardware in there, their main cost is energy. That's what's costing them money going forward. So if you can save money on the cloud, you're essentially saving energy. And I'll try and tie that into some of the technologies I'm talking about later. So imagine this is your local data center in your office. Um, and you've got to have the capacity to handle those peak loads. You always have to have those resources ready to go. Um, but if we move to the cloud, not only can we save money by freeing up those resources, we can then let other people use those resources. And again, sharing kind of the resources we have and hopefully lowering the energy consumption. Now, if we break that apart into say microservices, um, we have more granularity over, uh, more control over those services. So by making them smaller and making them be able to scale up and down quicker, um, again, we free up more resources for people to use, hopefully saving money and also saving energy. Now, of course, there are overheads with microservices. Of course, you've got to have a JVM in every container and stuff like that. But the work that's been done to most of the modern JVMs um, basically offsets a lot of that. They, they've done such good work in all the modern JVMs to kind of make them as small as possible, um, ready for this cloud native world, that it, the basically moving to microservices will, if you've got a big enough system, will save you money and will save you energy. And of course, there's all the other benefits that go with it. So I'm not gonna go into too much what are microservices. Everyone on this call probably knows what they are, but it's essentially loads of services which you can scale individually. So rather than say you've got a online website um, that's a shop. Now, of course, certain time, times of the year, for example, Christmas, you may have like um, a lot of load on a particular service. It may not be like creating a new account, but it may be the service that, you know, the shopping cart service or something like that. So rather than scale your whole website, essentially, you can just scale the individual part. And it also makes updating those parts um, a lot easier and you can have different teams work on um, different services. Okay, so a bit of history about open source. Now this is just a small snippet of the history of open source, but I've tried to kind of map out what I think are some of the most important, um, the important parts of open source's history. So first of all, we had the A2 system, which essentially a company shipped their product um, their program and they put the source code with it with a little feedback sheet on paper which basically said um, could you go through our source code and um, do you have any recommendations of things to change and then you'd fill out this little sheet you put it in a, a letter you'd send it off back to the company um, bit, a bit different to what we use with github um, but it's essentially kind of the first kind of occurrence I could see of like open source programs kind of a company um, getting feedback from its customers, shipping its source code with it so you can comment on it. Now, of course, then we have stuff like Linux and Debian, the first open source um, operating systems. So that was a big move forward for open source. And that was a big time gap from when the A2 system happened all the way till um, Debian was created. Then, of course, we've got OpenJDK. So um, giving Java to the open source community, also a massive thing. But I think in recent history, one of the biggest things that have basically bolstered or made the open source community so vibrant is GitHub. Having a platform where everyone can go, everyone knows how to use it, you can put your source code on there, people can comment on it, create issues, pull requests. Just having this platform has made open, make creating open source projects easy, maintaining them easy and getting loads of people to look at your project. And then of course, I can't not talk about Android. Android is definitely, in my opinion, one of the most successful open source projects that has ever existed. Um, loads of different companies have it on their devices. They've tweaked it in their own ways and they've got their own flavors and they're basically, you can, they've changed the UIs and everything. So I think Android is kind of a testament to how far open source technology has come over the years. And then you've got the standard benefits of open source. So study, copy, modify, redistribute. Um, but with privacy and security, obviously, if you've got loads of people looking at your source code all over the world um, with different mindsets, they will think of things that you and your organization may not. Um, so it helps find bugs with, to do with privacy and security. 
Um, again, low or no cost. So generally open source software is free, which is great if you just want to play around with the technology, you want to figure out if it's any good. Um, it's great for that. And then essentially when you get to the point where you want to shout at someone because something's broken, that's when you can then start looking at optional licensing. And then of course, we've got co uh, quality, collaboration and efficiency. Um, loads of people working together all over the world um, definitely aids in the, the quality and the efficiency and collaboration. So I could make a pull request right now um, and someone say in China could look at it, um, accept it, comment on it. And then by the time I wake up, I have a response. So having this kind of global community definitely helps with collaboration. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Clips Micro Profile. So for, for those who don't know what this is, um, essentially a Clips Micro Profile is an open source spec for enterprise Java microservices. Essentially, um, when, uh, yeah, so essentially Java EE wasn't going fast enough, at least not in the right direction. Um, so we, a lot of a community of individuals and organizations kind of came together and thought we need to create our own like enterprise spec for Java. And this is where Micro Profile came about. So these are some of the contributors. Um, yeah, so these are basically some of the contributors that we, we have. Um, and without these contributors, this project wouldn't have taken off and be where it is today. And um, there's more than 140 contributors now, and we have some extra excellent contributors, some of them Java champions, um, loads of different Java user groups talk about micro profile, and we have members of, loads of members of Java user groups that um, are, are contributors. So I'm not stalking anyone, I promise. Um, this information is freely available, but um, essentially I tried to map out where some of our contributors are. And as you can see, it's a quite nicely global spread um, around the world, which is cool. And there's loads of ways to get involved. So Google groups, by quarterly meetings, uh, micro profile projects, YouTube channel or video hangouts. And so these are some of our uh, vendors and implementations. So again, the great thing about this is it's vendor neutral. Um, you can go to any one of these vendors and get support. You're not tied into a specific vendor, um, which again would hopefully bring down costs because then you have a lot more competition in the market, which is good. So this is the Micro Profile 3.3 stack. Now there is a new version 4.0 coming out, I think hopefully by the end of the year, but um, don't worry too much about the version numbers. It's more the actual, the, the technologies and specifications in here that I want to talk about. So, the bottom line here is kind of what we looked at and thought this is what we kind of need to create, um, the basics we kind of need to create microservices with Java. Then the, the next lineup is more kind of um, to make them more robust, um, yeah, essentially it make them a lot easier to use. And then the top level is kind of to do with debugging, tracing, once you've deployed them to help you there. So I'll quickly go over some of them. Um, so the JAXRS, very easy to implement. You just need the app path variable. Um, I've got it so it produces and consumes um, JSON here and because that's a post request. Um, very easy and very simple to get started with. REST client, just a way to attach a microservice to a REST endpoint. And the only difference here you can see is the app REST, register REST client. Um, CDI, context dependency injection, very big topic. I'm not going to go too much into it, but essentially it allows you to manage the life cycle of your Java objects and easily inject them into microservices. Uh, JSONB and JSONP. So JSONB is essentially a way for you to turn a Java bean or a Java data object into JSON without really doing anything. And then your microservice on the other end will then turn that back into um, a Java object. So it easily allows you to send Java objects over um, JSON, over HTTP, which is really cool. And JSONP is a parser, as you may expect. So essentially it allows you to um, parse your JSON and get certain information out of there. Um, open API, so this is based on Swagger. So um, essentially it allows you to document your APIs. Um, so if you enable this feature in Open Liberty, it gives you a nice GUI with a front end, which allows you to essentially test your individual um, endpoints because with microservices, we can have lots and lots of different endpoints and having lots of different teams work on different microservices, it can then get confusing um, for another team to figure out what an endpoint does. So this allows you to document it, test it. You can even change the JSON. It tells you the response code you get back. So it's really good for kind of um, managing over lots of teams so you all kind of understand what these different endpoints do. Um, JWT is JSON web token. So now we have basically, instead of having one application, we've got loads of small services talking over a network. We need to secure that. And JSON web tokens, it essentially passes a, web to a JSON web token around in the um, HTTP header, which is assigned to a role. And then on top of a method, all you need to add is at roles allowed. 
it will then check if the request coming in has the correct role assigned to it. And if it does, it will allow you to run that method. If it doesn't, you'll get a permissions error. Um, so fault tolerance, this is based on something Netflix did, which was very clever. Um, so uh, for those of you who've got Netflix, you generally have like a recommendation bar at the top. Um, and what Netflix did is when that microservice goes down, um, they essentially use something very similar to fault tolerance where it'll do a certain amount of retries. If you can't talk to that um, microservice, it will then go and bring up, say, a default one. And as a user of, say, Netflix, for example, you don't really realize your recommendation bar is not showing you. You might look at it and think these are weird recommendations, but as far as you're concerned, Netflix isn't broken. It's working as it should. Whereas in reality, it's actually broken. But rather than have some horrible Java exception on everyone's TV, um, you just see a default recommendations. And that's kind of what you can do with this. So you can specify the exception you want to time out on. Um, you can specify the amount of retries and duration. And what, we didn't inc what I didn't include here is basically the ability to then go and call another method. And if it does fail that amount of retries, it will go and call this other method in the same class. And that method could then go and reach out to a default microservice, just like Netflix does. And I think this is critical in today's world because we're all extremely used to having everything working all the time. And if Netflix was breaking every day, would, people, would it still have the same amount of users? Probably not. So um, in this, this new world of everything being on all the time, stuff like fault tolerance is, um, is very good. Um, configuration, now we've got all these microservices, we need to kind of, we don't want configuration in each microservice. Um, and this helps, externalizing it helps a lot. So as we move our microservices through different stages in our pipeline, um, we can then just dial into different configurations as we go through. Um, and also with Open Liberty, you can use dynamic configuration. So you can change the configuration, say from true to false or something like that. And Open Liberty will automatically pick up that change um, and make the changes in your application, which is cool. Um, health, kind of what it says on the tin, um, basically just checks your microservices up and healthy before it starts sending requests to it. Um, so metrics, metrics are cool. So you generally get normal metrics like uh, JVM metrics. So um, stuff like uh, how much CPU you're using, what's your heap size, how much memory you're using, stuff like that. Um, but what you can do is do custom metrics. So for example, here <coughs> we have a coffee shop application and we are going to um, essentially start counting the amount of orders we're making. So we could do orders for a specific person, a specific type of coffee, stuff like that. So um, metrics is very, very valuable afterwards to get data out of our applications. Um, so open tracing, now we've got all these requests going everywhere. Um, debugging can get a bit of a nightmare. So by default, all JAXRS methods are traced, but then you can add custom tracing to your methods as shown here, and it'll trace all the uh, requests that go out of that method, which is cool. So what about containers and Kubernetes? Now I'm not gonna talk about Istio today, um, but how does MicroProfile work with containers and Kubernetes? So first of all, with um, config, you can use uh, Kubernetes config maps. So you can either create them via the command line or you can put them in your, um, your YAML. And basically, it can in, um, MicroProfile can inject those, um, configs that, those config properties into your um, application. And health, we can then map the health endpoint in MicroProfile to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes waits until it gets the right request back, the right response back before it starts sending requests to that new microservice. So test containers. So we can't talk about all of this and not talk about testing. Um, I do love test containers. They're quite a new-ish technology. I've been playing around with them for probably the last three, three months or so. Um, but essentially it kind of allows you to kind of try to replicate your environment in production as much as you can on a developer's machine. Um, and we do this with containers. So you can set up a container yourself, which kind of mirrors production. Um, you can either do that locally on your machine or you can store that in a container registry. And when you get to your testing phase um, of your, your microservice or your application, uh, it will then go and pull down that image if it's not already local. Um, you can then do some extra stuff to the image locally if you want, and then it will run your test in a containerized environment. And hopefully, this should try and replicate as much as possible your production environment. So our implementation of this is microshed testing. Um, there's lots of available runtime, so Open Liberty, you've got PyR and Micro and PyR Server, Quarkus and Wildfly. And I'm going to show you a bit of a demonstration um, after in a moment. But essentially, this is all kind of this is all that's really needed. So you've just add the annotation at microshed test at the top of your class. Um, also, bear in mind this 
go works in your testing phase of Maven. You don't need to do anything else to Maven to make this happen. Um, it'll just run your MicroShed tests as part of the testing phase, which is really good. Um, the app container is essentially the container you're setting up to run your tests in. Here we've just got the context root set, but you can set stuff like IP addresses, you can set um, ports, all kinds of things. And then you just inject the REST client you want to test against, um, in this case, my service, and then just have your tests um, in the app test annotation as you normally would with a JUnit test and test against that REST client. So we have these standalone projects. So I'm going to talk about MicroShed testing today, um, predominantly, but we also have reactive stream operators, which is really cool, and reactive messaging. And if um, any of you are interested in reactive architecture, I definitely would give it a look at. Um, after talking to lots and lots of people, it does seem like the way many people are going with microservices, so definitely worth a look. Um, but the standalone projects, they may come into MicroProfile, they may not, but I'm just put them on here because they work really, really well with this stack. Right, so I'm going to go and give you this interactive demo. So the URL you see here, please feel free to quickly copy that if you want to follow along. So what this is going to be, it's going to be in an online environment, all you need is a browser. I suggest Chrome because Safari, for some reason, we can't figure out why it doesn't work. It seems to be Safari's the new Internet Explorer these days. Um, but um, if you have Chrome installed or Firefox, go to the following URL. Um, and what you can do is this will give you a full IDE with instructions, with a terminal, with Kubernetes, with Docker, with Maven, with your JVM. So you can test out um, all these different cool technologies. So I'm going to go ahead and head over to that site now um, bear with me okay so it'll take you to here essentially um, and these are the four different modules and um, this will stay up after the session so please feel free to um, essentially uh, go through these modules whenever you want today again like I said I'm going to talk about microshit testing so I'm just going to load this up um, like I mentioned so this is a full um, a, essentially a development environment for you to get started with. So if you're starting from um, a new environment, it will have to create your container. So it may take a minute to start up. Um, but as you can see from here, we have our instructions on the left, um, which you increase the font size. So I'll make that a little bit bigger. So hopefully it's a bit easier for everyone to see. I'm just going to make my screen full screen. So that should make it a bit easier as well. Um, and then, yeah, so you've got your IDE here, IDE here. Um, which is called FIA, which is based on VS Code. It's an open source version. This is all running in a container in Kubernetes on the IBM Cloud. Um, and essentially, yeah, so it basically just allows us to all get started very, very quickly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clone down the Git repo. And um, there's little copy buttons here. So if you want to just copy them to your clipboard, you can just by clicking those buttons there. Um, so the finished directory in here, so as you can see, as we've cloned down that repo, it's come under the project directory, and here is basically all our, our good stuff, all our code. Um, I'm going to go into the finished directory and Maven verify, because this will essentially populate um, a lot of my Maven cache, which is what we need. Um, so we'll just give that a second to do that. Um, but yeah, so like I said, um, we have um, Docker on here, Kubernetes. There's also a version of this environment that has OpenShift. And I think, honestly, in the future, say in 20 years' time, will everyone have these really you know, powerful laptops to run all this stuff? What I think what will happen eventually is everything will start moving to the cloud. Um, oh, as you can see, so we're starting to run our MicroShed test now. So what it's going to do is set up our container. It'll download it if it doesn't already exist. Um, it'll take a bit of time the first time because it's obviously got to download and um, pull down the container from um, the, Git rep uh, the Docker repository. Um, but once it's done that, it'll run its tests in the container. Um, what it does by default, it kind of it kind of basically says it will run each test in a separate container. Um, that's by default. You can change it so it will keep running again in the same container, but it does this by default for kind of isolation. So as you can see, we've run tests here, no errors, everything seems to run and it's happy, which is good. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to run Open Liberty in dev mode. What's dev mode? Essentially, it enables us to make code changes without us having to keep stopping and starting the server every time. Um, so every time you've done a code change in less than a second, so 0 0.1 seconds, it will have that code change um, essentially compiled, put into the server. So by the time you've hit your browser to check the change, it should already be live, which is cool. Um, okay, so we'll just wait for this to start up. Give it a second. Um, 
so yeah, so essentially what this is going to do, hopefully now it's going to download all the uh, dependencies we need from Maven, download the Open Liberty server so everything's ready to go. So we hopefully can go through the rest of this demo quite quickly. Uh, just give it a moment. Get that on my board ready. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, I, I kind of see this as the future of like development environments going forward. Now it's not quite ready yet. Um, there's a lot more hurdles to overcome. Um, but with stuff like some of the OpenShift tools, um, you can install all of those into essentially this IDE. So as a developer, you don't ever have to leave. Um, you don't have to leave your IDE to do anything. You can code in it. You can test in it. You can get it into um, testing stages in your organization, all the way up to production without leaving your IDE. Um, so I think these environments are absolutely wicked, and I think they're definitely going to be where um, development goes in the future. Maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, but yeah, I can definitely see it going um, this direction. Okay, so we'll start Liberty again with Dev Mode. This should start a lot quicker now. Now we are in. Now we populate that Maven cache. Um, so it's going to run some tests, as you can see here. Um, the test is going to be pretty blank, and I'll show you the what the test consists of, which is pretty much nothing. Um, and then we'll get going, basically um, turning that test into a microshed test. So let's go into the start directory, um, go into source, into test, and there should be a test file in here called person test. Yes. So very standard, basic, JUnit kind of test. There's nothing in here at the moment, um, but we're going to basically turn this into a microshed test. So first of all, let's add the import for microshed testing. And then as you saw earlier, um, we just need to put the annotation at the top of the class just so um, Maven knows this is a microshed test. Um, yeah, so essentially now we need to add imports. Um, so we need the container, like I showed you before, um, that our test is going to run in. So we'll put the application container test in there. And then I'm going to go ahead and copy in um, the container into here. Cool, right, I'm just gonna get the indentation fixed because it'll drive me crazy. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, so basically all we set here is the context route. Um, another thing we've set um, that worked really well is we've set the readiness path. So what this will do is go and check um, the health endpoints in micro profile to check that um, the microservice is ready to receive requests before the test starts doing that. And you should close this. Okay, so yeah, so now we've added that, so that's that's essentially what that's going to do. Um, so if we go and call this endpoint, so I'm going to open a new terminal. Um, we should be able to then call this endpoint and it should come back with a ready state to say yes, and the status is up and the microservice is ready to reserve, uh, receive requests, which is cool. Um, so one thing uh, dev mode does is it gives you the ability to rerun the test just by pressing enter. Now you don't probably don't want to rerun the test every time um, you make a tiny code change, um, but you don't want to have to restart your server to run the test. Um, so by going back to the terminal and pressing enter, it will run the test. And again, we had a basic test. It didn't really do anything and it passed. So as expected, so that's all good. So now we need a REST client. So I'm just going to add that into, I haven't saved this yet, by the way. So um, it's still running the previous JUnit test. Um, so I've added in our REST client. So we'll put it under here. Do, do, do. Okay, there's our REST client, which is the person service. This is essentially what we're going to go and test against. Um, so now let's go and import, essentially, uh, we need the, the standard JUnit thing of um, assert, <laughs> assertions, assert not equal null, of course. Um, and then we're gonna add this logic, some basic logic to our test here. So I'll go put that in. I'm going to fix the indentation before it drives me mad. Okay, there we go. So now we've got a nice basic test. Um, yep, yeah, nice and simple, nothing uh, too complicated in there. And what we're going to do now, I'm going to go and save this. Okay, so that's saved. And as you can see, it knows it was a test that was saved rather than the actual um, code for the application. <clears throat> and what we do now, simply press enter and it should go and run our tests. And fingers crossed, the demo god's on our side. So as you can see already, it already knows and um, that's a microshed test. Ignore the um, thing here. This is just, to, I haven't set any logging because uh, you have to set some logging on microshed test to output the log to somewhere outside of the container. Um, but as you can see, that happened very, very quickly. Look how quick that um, container started. Again, we've already downloaded the container and populated the Maven cache. So once you've done that, um, it, it, it runs these tests very, very quickly. 
And as you can see, we got the right response from the server and everything worked very well. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to copy all of this, which is essentially a nice big um, load of tests just to make sure they all work. So these actually do a bit more, um, something substantial. So we've got tests, create a new person, test the minimum size, the minimum age, um, test getting a person, test getting all the people and testing updating the age. So I'm going to go and save that. And as you can see, um, it automatically compiled it and it's all ready to go. And if I press enter, now it should run all those tests. Um, there you go. And as you can see how quick that happens, that happened very, very quickly. Now we're running all these tests now in the same container because we're running um, Open Liberty in dev mode. When you stop running Open Liberty in dev mode, essentially what will happen is it will run them all in um, different kind of uh, different containers essentially. And then that's done by default to kind of have um, isolation. Now you can change that, that's just a default value. Um, but yeah, that's essentially how you can basically turn a J unit test into a microshare test and this all happens as part of your testing phase in Maven so it's very very simple to get started with. So I am going to log out of this environment now and again everyone feel free to play around with this environment if you want. Um, you, you have to create an account you can do it any way you want with um, github and it's very easy to delete your account afterwards if you are concerned about privacy and stuff like that. Um, so I and, and basically all your information is not done for any reason um, it's not it's essentially it's it's not there for um, uh, purposes for tracking or anything like that. It's basically just so we don't get hammered by a hacker and we have no control over their accounts and stuff like that. So it's basically to implement something like that. Okay, so I'm going to go and close this because for some reason it's uh, not log letting me log out quickly. Um, I'll go back to my presentation and we will carry on. So I'm going to talk a bit about Open Liberty now. So what is Open Liberty if you've never heard of it? Essentially, it's a lightweight Java application server built for microservices. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Web Server Application Server. Um, it's, it's a great application server, don't get me wrong, but it's very, very difficult to administer. It's very, very big and bulky. It takes way too long to come up for developers purposes. If you want to make a change, um, having to wait 15 minutes between a, a small change is not a it is a ridiculous amount of time to say the least. Once it's up and running, don't get me wrong, it works very, very well. Um, we've had clients that have had one running for 15 years and uh, have never shut it down and it's just carried on working. Um, one of my first tasks in uh, when I worked on the mainframe was to actually um, set up a web server application server. Um, I kind of spent a day or two on it, went back to my team lead and said, I can't do this. <laughs> this is way, way, way too difficult for me. So we all kind of went back to the drawing board and came up with Open Liberty. So Open Liberty, we've kind of tried to focus on code. So create, having stuff like dev mode. So Open Liberty by itself generally starts up in about eight seconds. And I will show you some tweaks and things we've done to make that much, much better. But we wanted to create something for developers. And the great thing about Open Liberty is you can develop on Open Liberty and use your code on um, Web Store Application Server. It pretty much has similar functionality. Um, one thing Open Liberty does is it's modular, which is really good. So it's a very small application server that you basically add features, add the features you want, and it gets bigger. Um, again, we were one of the first products um, to be in containers. That was one of my first jobs at IBM. Um, and that was great fun learning about how to do all of that. But yeah, um, being in containers today, most microservices, they are running containers. Um, and that's kind of what we started with. And then, we, like I said, we've got stuff like dev mode, which basically allows you to make changes very quickly. They get deployed in, say, 0.1 seconds or less um, and compiled. And basically, um, yeah, so you can test your changes very, very quickly, as opposed to the old experience we used to have. And we are a fully open source um, project. We have our own website, so um, we don't, we're not under the IBM website. So we've basically been able to create what we wanted here. And we have some brilliant, brilliant documentation, guides on loads of different things. And we're not biased in regards to, for example, um, a specific cloud. We have guides um, for all the cloud providers. So I don't know who saw the 2020 Jakarta EE developer survey. Um, they made a lot of bold statements, as you can literally see here. Um, the one I'm going to focus on is the third one, which is basically the popularity of microservice may be waning with the usage of microservice arch architecture for implementing Java systems in the cloud declining since last year. Now, do I think uh, microservice architecture is going anywhere? No. Um, I would definitely recommend if you're creating a new application that's basically you want it cloud native 
you should be using microservices, no doubt about that. Um, so what do I think this means and why am I talking about this? So these, in my mind, are the spectrum of architectural styles. Now, you may not agree with the macro services statement, and I'll, kind, I'll try and explain what macro services mean to me. So, of course, you all know what monoliths are. And just to clarify, a distributed monolith, I do not consider as a macro service. Now, that is a well-architected monolith. And macro services are more right-sized services. So I see a lot of people getting to the kind of point of macro services when they try and break apart monoliths. And sometimes services are so highly coupled together, it's just too difficult to break them apart. And, you know, if you need to scale a service and you have to scale other highly coupled services again at the same time, then there isn't really that much benefit about breaking them apart anymore. Um, and some people may just not want to go down the massive complexity route of microservices. So they may just get, think microservices is the way to go. Um, of course, then you've got microservices. Um, which are like what we're mostly talking about today. And again, if you were creating net new applications for the cloud, that's what I definitely recommend. Or function as a service. Function as a service is kind of, it comes up, it does its function, it does what it needs to do, and then shuts back down. Um, again, there's a lot more complex, there's even more complexity involved with function as a service as opposed to microservices. But function as a service is very good in regard to saving money and energy on the cloud. Having the ability to scale that quickly up and down um, definitely enables you to save money and again, hopefully energy. And it's not just me talking about this. There is lots of people in the industry that are talking about um, people not wanting to go down to the granularity of microservices and stuff like that. And this is why I'm talking about it, because this is where I want to kind of talk about where Open Liberty fits in. Um, so again, back to Web3 Application Server, it was a very big application server and it does its job very well. It's just very difficult to set up. It's very difficult to maintain. Um, and yeah, for, from a developer's point of view, it, it, it's a pain to say the least. Um, and that's why we created Open Liberty. And Open Liberty pretty much has all the capabilities of Web3 Application Server, um, but it has startup time of just over one second. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so it, it basically spans pretty much everything from monolith all the way down to microservice. So it's a good application server for pretty much everything. Now, you can use it for functions of the service, but this is where I believe technologies like Quarkus really come into their own. Having the ability to come up in less than a second, um, definitely for function as a service, that's what you want. You want something to be able to scale up and down very, very quickly. Um, and that's where Quarkus really comes into its own. And again, Quarkus is good for microservices, but when you're dealing with full Java um, EE applications or Jakarta EE applications now, um, Open Liberty is definitely a really, really good contender. So we've been chasing this one second startup time for the last couple of years now, um, and we've pretty much got it there. It's just over one second, and that has come through improvements in uh, the underlying JVM, which is OpenJ9. Um, you can use other JVMs, it's not just OpenJ9, um, and improvements in Open Liberty as well. So this is a startup comparison of Open Liberty against other Java application servers, and this isn't using OpenJ9, this is using Hotspot. And already you can see we are very competitive. We have a better startup time um, than all of the other um, Java application servers listed here. But then when you use OpenJ9 with class cache, um, which is, I'm going to demonstrate to you later, um, essentially we brought that time down to pretty much a second. Now the other Java application servers, um, their time has still come down. So even if you're, you're listening to this and you're not considering Open Liberty, you should definitely consider you thinking about OpenJ9 because OpenJ9 brings loads of benefits um, and we'll talk a bit about those um, later on. Um, again, startup time, um, this is not just with one application, we've tested this with lots of different applications and it has improved our startup time. Um, and in Docker, so I'm going to demonstrate this shared class cache um, JVM argument in Docker. Essentially, the online learning environment is all running in Docker, like I mentioned on Kubernetes. And as it stands, luckily, <laughs> without um, the class cache sharing enabled, OpenWT starts up um, with a basic REST application in around um, yeah eight seconds on the environment I'm going to show you. And then you'll see that startup time decrease. And hopefully, praying to the demo gods, it will work. Um, again, so some other metrics, startup time, memory, so startup time only held done is actually a slight, slightly bit faster at starting up. But if you look at memory footprint um, and throughput, which is really what we want to focus on in the cloud, um, 
Open Liberty is a much, much quicker than some of the other contenders. Um, so we talk about Spring Boot and Spring does work with, um, of open liberty. But the problem is with Spring is it creates these Uber jars, which are very, very big. And then every time you make a change or you want to make a change yeah, to your microservice, you have to push this big fat layer, which is a lot of megabytes of data. Um, so what we've done is we played around with kind of the layering of how Spring is done in Spring Boot to kind of bring that down and make the layers much, much smaller. So, um, and that will give you a, a faster startup time, we've managed to create the memory footprint is lower and the throughput performance is better. So how have we done that? So essentially we separated out the spring application classes into the top, which are so your application classes at the top, which are very small generally, um, and they're pushed all the time. Obviously you're making a change, you have to change um, those classes. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and then we've got the Spring Boot core classes, which they do change. Um, you have updates to the Spring Boot core classes, which do change. So Hopefully, um, it within it one day or a week, you, that will not get updated much, but your application may get updated, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 times a day. And, and that's the thing we care about. And then the bit that doesn't change very often is, say, the JVM, the a, a Java application server you're running on. And basically, that's the thing we generally don't have to change much. So the steps we've taken, um, so we've minimized the JRE to make that nice and small. So we've got that from 98 megs down to 59. Um, we've used Minify and Open Liberty, which shrinks Open Liberty down massively, down from 154 megabytes. That's including all the features we need, down to 25 megabytes. And then again, we thin and layer the Spring Boot application. So separating out your application code from the Spring Boot core classes to bring down the size that you push and change all the time. Um, so if let's have a look at how Open Liberty compares with Tomcat, for example, which is the default. Um, uh, runtime for um, Spring Boot. Now, Spring Boot, uh, Tomcat does still start up slightly faster, and I mean slightly faster than Open Liberty with um, Spring. But then if you look at memory footprint, Open Liberty has like one fifth of the memory footprint that Tomcat has when it comes to Spring. And even in throughput, we have nearly double the throughput. Um, so Open Liberty definitely is a, um, a Java application server you should have a look at and just decide, just play around with it. It's all open source, um, it's free to use, so just have a play around with it and see if it brings any benefits to you. Um, I don't know if anyone's um, ever seen this technology, CRIU. Essentially, it allows you to hibernate um, your, your application and your JVM and everything and then start it back up whenever you want. And we've played around with this technology. It's a very new technology and it has a lot of issues to say. Um, but as a proof of concept, we've managed to get our startup time down with, um, with some of our applications down to way less than a second. I'm talking 0.2 seconds, 0.1 seconds. Um, and this, this technology could save us a lot of money and a lot of energy on the cloud. And being able to restart the state of something just like that um, definitely could uh, be beneficial in the future. Um, so to summarize, Open Liberty and Open J9, and um, they work very well together. And um, having influence on both sides of that stack has definitely enabled us to make improvements to Open, Open Liberty. So let's talk about a bit of Open J9. So Adopt Open JDK has now joined the Eclipse Foundation, which Open J9 is part of. Um, so if we think of the cloud, um, so this is a traditional kind of when you start up an application. This is traditionally kind of what happens now. You have this lag at the beginning of it ramping up. That is costing you money, and you're not really doing anything there. You're waiting for your essentially everything to start up. But while it's doing that, that's costing you money. And you also have like an over-peak usage. So when it's finished ramping up, you have a bit of a peak, and then it goes back down again. Again, this is all costing you money and energy on the cloud. This is what we really want. We want it to start up very quickly and get to its peak and its throughput where we want. So I don't know who remembers um, who remembers this phone? Uh, one of my favorite phones, battery life used to last a week. Um, but this is kind of the requirements for this phone. Um, so we needed small footprint. Of course, it had very small uh, RAM size or ROM. Um, we needed it to start up very quickly. You didn't want to get on your game of snake and all of a sudden it lags at the beginning and slowly gets faster. You're going to keep bumping into the wall and you're not going to get a very high score on snake. Right? Um, so yeah, we need a very, very quick ramp up and very quick startup time. And this is essentially the same requirements for Java in the cloud. And so we try to take these requirements and try and put them in OpenJ9. Um, so OpenJ9 essentially came about, this was IBM's enterprise Java. So all of our customers and clients, they were using, they've been using this Java for 
a long, long time. And IBM has put loads and loads of effort into making this JVM run much faster. Because essentially customers, they want, they want their JVM to save them money. They don't want it utilizing resources that it doesn't need to. Um, so stuff like compared to Hotspot, it's got much faster startup time, much smaller footprint, and a lot more um, throughput performance. And it has really great um, platform support, and I think they now support ARM um, architecture as well. Um, but these are, like we said, these are kind of the, the, the key things we're looking at when we're thinking about the cloud. Um, startup time, footprint, ramp up time, response time, and managing these is quite difficult. Um, of course, when you make a change to one thing, um, it affects another. So balancing all this um, has been quite tricky. Um, and we've tried to get the right balance as much as possible. Um, so we've got great uh, small images, and it's very easy to try OpenJ9 if you're using containers. Just change the image you get your JVM from to an OpenJ9 image, and just test it and see what differences you get in startup time and in throughput and stuff like that. Um, and it, the good thing about um, OpenJ9 is if you give it a load of memory, it doesn't go and consume a load of memory. Um, Hotspot and other, other JVMs, if you give them big container sizes, they consume more. And I don't see why. Um, what, is, what is the reason? I'm giving you more resources, but um, if you don't need to use those resources, why are you using them? Um, and OpenJ9 does a really good job at keeping that down. Um, there's also cool tweaks, and I'm going to go and show you one on the class cache sharing later, but this is basically enables you to tweak it. So when your JVM is idle, um, essentially it, it basically, um, uh, yeah, basically it lowers the amount you're using. So it, it um, lowers the amount of resources and megabytes you're using. You've also got the JIT server. So a JIT server is basically yeah, a load balancer. Um, and what it does is basically it allows you to handle constrained environments. So here we have OpenJ9 and then OpenJ9 with JIT server enabled. And it's pretty much the same in a normal environment. We can strain it a little bit by 50 megabytes. As you can see, OpenJ9 is already struggling a little bit. And then if we can strain it even more, um, OpenJ9 with the JIT server enabled it is still performing very well, whereas the OpenJ9 without it enabled is starting to struggle. Um, so it's really good for very constrained environments. Um, and again, we need a fast startup time um, to save money and energy on the cloud. Um, and also, you know, having stuff start up quickly allows us as developers to test our code quicker. Um, again, scaling out is definitely needed. Um, and if you have outages, it enables you to quickly get something up and running very quickly. And so you don't have customers that are waiting with a broken application, essentially. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about class cache sharing. So essentially, um, it, this essentially is a, a file which um, when you start up your application, um, the JVM will go and look at and basically look for any kind of classes and stuff that, um, it, that are being used regularly on startup. Um, and it, we do this with the at in time compiler. So again, what is class cache sharing? Um, essentially, it's a fixed amount of memory that persists beyond the life of your JVM. So you can shut your application down, you can shut your, um, your computer down, and this will persist. Um, it's generally a fixed size on Linux. I can't remember exactly what it is, but you can increase um, that size if you want. Um, so normally with a JVM, you would have the class loader cache, the parent, and then the file system. What, in contrast, what we have is the class loader cache, the parent, then the shared class cache, and then the file system. And this improves startup time dramatically. And all you need to do is basically add this argument x share classes. Um, you can give it a name. Um, you don't have to. That enables you to essentially have different shared class classes for different on the same JVM for different applications. Um, and again, you can increase the size, but on Linux, it's typically a, there we go, 32 megabytes in size. So that's kind of an overview of an OpenJ9. It's very easy to get started with. Again, if you're using containers, you can just switch um, switch the container you're using from. Um, yeah, fast start at time, used by all different enterprises across the planet, and it's good for loads of different environments. Um, so small to large. And I'm going to quickly show you now um, an example uh, of class cache sharing, essentially. And I'm going to do it in this online environment. Uh, okay, so let's get started. Okay, so I'm going to pick just a, a normal blank project, something, um, uh, yeah, essentially that has let me just close down what I had before. So yeah, the great thing about this environment, it will save your changes until you log out. So if you need to go and do something for half an hour and come back, um, you still have your environment and everything's still there. So, okay, so let's get out of this 
folder here. I'm going to close this down and close the directory down. And what we're going to do is we're going to clone down this simple REST um, guide and we're going to go into the finished directory. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly show you how easy it is to essentially um, uh, enable class cache sharing. So I'm just going to run Liberty, um, get the application started up, and you'll see roughly how long it takes for Open Liberty to start up. And then what we're going to do is we're going to enable class cache sharing. So in the source main directory, we have a Liberty directory, which contains configuration. Um, the server.xml, just for a brief overview, is just to enable features. Um, ignore these tags, these are to do with the actual guide itself. Um, but yeah, it's just to enable you add features and set endpoints and stuff. But what we're going to do is create a new file in here called jvm.options. Uh, okay, so I've created that file. And then we're going to, I think I still, oh, so x share classes um, let me just confirm that i've got that right before i make a fool of myself um yep x share classes that's all good um okay so as you can see the default server started in nine seconds now right so i'm going to shut that server down again I'm going to save this and then essentially I'm just going to run it again. So first time it's got to populate your shared class cache. Um, so the first time should be the same as any other kind of startup time, um, but uh, it may take a little bit longer, but this is all you need to do is to get this running. Enable that variable and start up your application server. Um, do, 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 started in six seconds. Um, so now if we stop the application server, our shared class cache should be essentially all ready to go, all populated. And now, fingers crossed, in this Docker environment, running on Kubernetes, running in the IBM cloud, hopefully this should start up faster now. Yep, so as you can see, I have now brought that time down from nine seconds, I think it was, down to 1.7 seconds. And the more you keep running this, the more it will populate that cache and the lower that time will go. Obviously, there's a lower limit, it'll only get so far. Um, but as you can see, just by, that little tweak on the JVM, we've managed to bring down the startup time um, of our application server. So again, I just want you to all remember, so compute equals money. When we're on the cloud, everything we do is costing us money. And what does that mean? Um, yep, gigabytes per hour is costing us money. And again, gigabytes per hour money is costing us energy. So um, again, it's not a compelling thing to think about saving our organization a little bit of money, but then when you think about trying to save the planet and save a bit of energy, then it might be a bit more personal to us as developers. Um, quick recap, so again, micro profile, no vendor locking, loads of cloud ready APIs, big community, open liberty, it's um, open source, uh, modular application services, nice and lightweight, very easy to configure. Um, we were the, I think the first Jakarta EE8 certified application server um, and loads of official Docker images, depending on what you want to do with it. And then OpenJ9, low memory footprint, fast startup time, um, and a high application throughput, and very easy to get started with Docker images. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed my talk. Um, I don't know if I think I overran a little bit, but um, if you've got, um, yeah, please let me know if you've got any questions. Okay, Thank you. You're okay. You're on time. No worries. Okay, wicked. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> you can run. I know you can run. I wonder if all the Java people can run as you run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's good. It is good. I think it was a really good, good, good uh, walkthrough. Awesome. Um, good. Yeah, and I loved the fact that you emphasized on you know saving the trees, so to say. Yeah, I mean, again, a lot of people don't think about that. I mean, it's very easy to be disconnected from what's going on in these humongous data centers, which are using all our energy. So, um, I and I never really thought about it until about a year ago, and now I've started to think about it more and incorporate it into my talk. So. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to think about. It's a good message. It's a good message. I really appreciate Thanks. it. And we've got some, uh, some questions, of course. The first question is related to the, uh, the micro, micro profile framework. Yes, yeah. So is it too heavy weighted or does it need a full application server or other dependencies? Yeah, so um, well, it depends what you mean by a full application server. So micro profile runs on stuff like Quarkus as well. Um, so Quarkus is very small, very, very lightweight. Um, so 
yeah, you do. You need something to run it on. Essentially, you need something to run your Java application on. Um, but you can. There are loads of technologies out there, and um, to make that as easy as possible. So again, OpenLibc is very lightweight, and then you've got stuff like Quarkus, which is very lightweight. Um, you've also got stuff like Pyara and Heladon. Again, all very lightweight application servers. Um, so yeah, you do need something to run it on, but you, you you can find technologies that are so small that you you know you don't really care so much about it. Right, right. I'm sure there is a an, an entire roadmap. Uh, for yes, yes, yes. So version four is coming out of MicroProfile by the end of this year. And um, if you go onto the MicroProfile website, again, this is all open source and all community based. So if you go onto the MicroProfile website, you should find um, a roadmap on there about where it's going in future. Um, they're, they're very much doubling down on stuff like container technologies and stuff like that going forward. Um, but yeah, there's loads of cool stuff to come with MicroProfile. All right. What's your favorite game? What's my favorite game? Oh, um, well, any any game full stop? I mean, I've got, uh, that was a very random question. I, oh, you, I see what you've got That's on there, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I like strategy games, but I, I play everything, Call of Duty, yeah, anything. Um, if you're talking about computer games, yeah, I, I like strategy games myself. I don't know. If, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Cool. Rome Total War, I'm a big fan of like, um, games like that, turn-based games. Yeah, love them. Back in the days, did you have a, like, like a business or something, or, or did I got it wrong? No, 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 didn't, no, never had a game business. I would like to have a game business, that'd be fun. Um, in the picture you've got up there, that's basically me at a conference, and they, um, they were using, because uh, uh, IBM sponsors Red Bull, and they basically had the Red Bull game there, so um, when all the attendees were in their talks, I was just sitting there racing around the track trying to beat all my colleagues and get the best time. <laughs> right, right. Cool. Uh, you're very involved in the community and contributing quite a lot. Uh, what's your next step? What's your next company? Yeah, so I, I love education. Um, I love delivering education. And this year has been obviously quite difficult with obviously the pandemic on and stuff like that. Um, so I've been working a lot on that virtual online environment because um, one of the problems with workshops, and I've had, I've been, I had the same problem last time I came to Romania. So I came to, um, was it Cluj? Yeah, I came to Cluj. And essentially, um, you sit down in the, the workshop, and it was a four-day workshop, but some of the attendees, they, you have to spend like hours getting all the prereqs sorted. Some people might not have the right version of Windows, so they can't even install Docker. So regardless of the pandemic, I already started to think about ways I can remove this, essentially, this barrier. Um, so we started talking about this, and just because of the pandemic, essentially, it's made us innovate and create this online environment. So I'm kind of pioneering this online environment, trying to get as many people in IBM to use it as possible, to put as many technologies on there as possible, um, just so I can expand the amount of people I can educate. And for example, this year I've been to places, uh, not physically, but I, I managed to be at conferences in places I wouldn't have ever got to before because they were just too far away. Um, so basically trying to expand essentially my reach as much as possible and create new learning platforms to get people learning technologies, regardless of if it's IBM um, technology, just to get people to, ed like, to help educate people as much as possible. And that's kind of, I think, where, where I'm going to go for the foreseeable future, basically. So this is how you're changing the world, Jamie. And I... Yeah, thank you. applause is for you and uh, big thanks. And un until next time. Yeah, definitely. It was a pleasure. and Thank you for having me so much. Um, and hopefully next year or hopefully sometime in the future, I can come in person and deliver a talk in person.